Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Where would we be if we hadn't had Andrew's teaching? It has just really like given me so many revelations. He filled me with a new vision of myself. I'm so grateful that he has been obedient to the calling that God has placed on his life. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. I've now been teaching on a subject that I've entitled The Believer's Authority, and I, this is my seventh program that I've made on this. I've already covered a lot of material. There's no way I can go back and rehash everything, but please get this teaching. I'm teaching things that are just different than what most people believe. Matter of fact, the subtitle of this is What You Didn't Learn in Church. There's very few people that I've ever heard teach this. Of course, there's a lot of people that have this in some respects, but this week I'm teaching something that I've never heard anybody else teach. Let me just go back and say that I've already established that all authority comes from God, but when God created man, He spoke and He's bound by His Word. God cannot lie, Hebrews 6, 18. Uh, he upholds all things by the Word of His power, Hebrews 1, 3. Uh, Psalms 89:34 says, His covenant will He not break nor alter the thing that has gone forth out of His mouth. Psalms 138, verse 2, He's magnified His Word above all of His name. And on and on I could go. God, when He says something, it becomes binding. And He told Adam and Eve, You have dominion over this earth. He made them gods, not capital, but small g, absolute rulers, over this earth. And so he was bound by what he said. So when he gave Adam and Eve authority, that means he was no longer in direct control. He could only function in this world through people because uh, uh, John chapter 4, verse 24 says, God is a spirit. He's not a physical being. He gave authority, dominion over this earth to physical human beings. And we are the ones that have messed things up. And God would have been unjust to come down here and just say, King's X, time's out, do over. This is not what I wanted. He would have had to have brought, broken his word and he cannot lie. He cannot do that. And so this whole mess that we see in the world today is because of our authority and we gave it to the devil. So I laid that foundation last week and yesterday I started laying a foundation that Lucifer didn't get his power from God. And I think that this is really significant because if you think that you're fighting a being that is superior to you and that he has superior power and authority, well, then it's intimidating. And the church loves to give Satan all of this power and authority because it justifies their ineffectiveness. And people say, well, you don't understand. The devil made me do it. And, they, and people have come to me and have, have glorified the devil and given him much more power than he deserves. Did you know even the Gadarene demoniac came out and meant Jesus? And this man had so many demons. He had a legion of demons, which describes 6,000 demons, if you go by a Roman legion. And yet he ran and fell at the feet of Jesus. Now, he may not have had the power to overcome and get free on his own, but he, I guarantee you the demons weren't worshiping Jesus. This man, even a man with 6,000 demons, could still come and throw himself at the feet of Jesus. For you to sit there and say, well, the devil is in control. I just can't break this habit. That's a lie. He can't do those things without your consent and cooperation. And so what I'm trying to do is to show where Satan got his power. He did not come against Adam and Eve as this superior angelic being. He was in the Garden of Eden, according to Ezekiel chapter 28. Those are the verses that I read yesterday, and it described him in his sinless state. He was still there in perfection. He was there to serve Adam and Eve, not to oppose them. And I made this point that I would be irresponsible to send my children outside to play if I knew there was a wolf or a bear or something that could do them damage. God did not put Adam and Eve in the garden with this demonic power there to tempt them. That would be irresponsible. Satan was there to serve them. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14 says, All of the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation. 
And so let me take another passage of Scripture that describes Satan again. And this is out of Isaiah chapter 14. And in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 4, Thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of his rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth him. I made this same point on yesterday's program, but this isn't actually talking about the actual person. It's talking about the demonic power that works through him. And I made that clear over in Ezekiel chapter 28, where it even called him a cherub, an angel. It said that he had been in, in the Garden of Eden, still in his sinless state. And right here, if you just jump down to the 12th verse, it calls him Lucifer. This is talking about Lucifer, an angel. It's not talking about the actual king here. It's talking about the demonic power that worked through him. And so in verse 7, it says, The whole earth is at rest and is quiet, and they break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. In verse 9, it says, Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee, at thy coming, it stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all of the kings of the nations, and they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vows, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Right here, it uses that term Lucifer to refer to this uh, being. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart. Now, this is talking about Lucifer and what his transgression was. This tells you what he was thinking. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Did you know Satan's transgression wasn't that he hated God and disliked everything about him. It's that he envied God. He wanted to be like him. And if you put this together with Ezekiel chapter 28, the verses that I used yesterday, uh, it talks about that he was this musical being that had pipes and tabrets in him. And apparently... He was created to give all of this worship and glory to God, and he was envious. He wanted all of that to go towards himself. And so his transgression wasn't rebellion in the sense that he disliked God and wanted to be uh, the opposite of God. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to sit on the sides of the north. He wanted people to worship him. You know, this is the reason that I believe that praise and worship is such a powerful weapon against the devil. There's examples of David playing the heart and the evil spirit departing. There's examples of Elijah calling for a minstrel and the anointing of God came upon him when um, Paul and Silas in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts started praising God at midnight. Man, an earthquake came and uh, people were set free and the jailer was healed, uh, saved and healed his family and all of the prisoners. I tell you, praise is a powerful, powerful weapon against the devil. Jesus even said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise, is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 21. He was quoting from Psalms where it says, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength. And so you put those together, it shows you that praise is strength to break the power of of the enemy. And I believe the reason it's so is because Isaiah chapter 14 shows that he is envious of God. He wants all of the glory, all of the praise that is directed towards God. So when you start giving praise to God, man, it just rubs his nose in what he's always wanted and never been able to get. And he is the ultimate egomaniac. He cannot stand you praising God. So when you begin to praise God, Satan just vacates. He leaves. He can't handle it. Man, that's awesome. And this is just andeology, but 
YOU KNOW, WE ARE JUST COMING OUT OF THE CHRISTMAS SEASON AND I LOVE CHRISTMAS. I AM NOT AGAINST CHRISTMAS AND ALL OF THOSE THINGS. THERE, there ARE SOME GODLY FOUNDATIONS TO ALL OF THAT, BUT IT HAS BEEN CO-OPTED AND HIJACKED IN SOME CASES BY A FAT MAN IN A RED SUIT. I BELIEVE THAT ST. NICHOLAS WAS A REAL PERSON AND MAYBE THERE WERE ORIGINS you know, in godly things of Saint Nicholas, but the way that it's presented today, I think that the I think Satan is behind a lot of this because he just cannot stand people giving the glory and the praise to God. He can't stand a day to where we just sit here and glorify God for the greatest gift that has ever been given, the gift of his son becoming flesh. And so he tries to divert our attention. If he can't stop you from believing in God, well, then he wants you to get preoccupied, dilute it, dilute the praise that is going towards God. And the same thing happens at Easter when we should be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. We talk about a rabbit that lays eggs. <laughs> That's not even physically possible. And then at Halloween, that used to be hallowed evening before All Saints Day, where we remember all of these godly people that have made a difference. And so he co-ops it. And instead, we talk about witches and goblins. And it's turned out that Halloween has become more popular and more focus on it than the All Saints Day the next day. It's just Satan's attempt. He is an egomaniac and he wants all of the glory that goes to God to, co to come towards him. So that's what Isaiah chapter 14 is describing and Ezekiel chapter 28 described that when he was in the garden, he was still in his sinless state. So I'm using those things to say that in Genesis chapter 3, when Satan came against Adam and Eve, it, it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, that it was the serpent. But you put this together with what Jesus said in, in John chapter um, 8, verse 44, it says that Satan is a liar and the father of all lies. Here is the first lie recorded in Scripture. And because of what Jesus said, I can guarantee you Satan, Lucifer, this angelic being was behind the lies that this serpent was speaking. And why did, did the devil choose the serpent instead of some powerful animal or some vicious animal to try and intimidate Adam and Eve? It was because he had no power to force them to do anything. He was a created angelic being sent there to minister for them, not against them. He had no power against Adam and Eve. So he had to come with lies and deception. And notice the very first thing he did in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Boy, there's a lot in this. I've meditated on this thousands of hours. I could take every word in this and preach for a very long time on every single word. I'm just condensing this very quickly. But I believe that the reason he approached the woman instead of the man over in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says the woman was deceived, but the man wasn't deceived. And Adam was right there with her. It says in verse 6 down here that she took of the apple, or excuse me, I, I went by tradition. It's not an apple. It doesn't say apple. It says she took of the fruit and ate and gave to her husband, which was with her. Adam was there with her. He was watching this whole thing. He listened to the whole thing. And, and it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that he was not deceived. He knew what was going on. Eve was deceived. You know why I believe that Satan came to the woman first? Some people have said it's because women are just more vulnerable, more easily deceived than men. I don't think that that's what it is at all. I think that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, the Lord told Adam not to eat of the fruit of, the, of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil before Eve was formed. You can go on and read in Genesis chapter 2. It was after this command not to eat of the fruit of the tree that Eve was created. And so that means that Eve didn't get this command directly from God. She got it from Adam. And anytime you get something through another person, that leaves the potential that maybe they didn't say it exactly right. Have you ever played this game where, you know, they call, I think the name of the game is gossip, but you start down at one end and somebody whispers something to the next person and then they're supposed to re 
repeat the phrase exactly to the next person. You go through five or six people, I can guarantee you by the time you get to the sixth person, it's not going to be repeated exactly. There is just something lost in transmission from person to person. And I believe that the reason that Satan came to Eve is because she got this information second hand, which meant that maybe it wasn't right. Maybe Adam didn't say it exactly the way it was. What this means to me is that you don't just need to take my word for these things. This is the reason that I really always promote product is because it's one thing to hear me speak the truth, but then you need to get these things. You need to look up the scriptures. You need to find these things out for yourselves. It, do, it doesn't do you any good to say, well, Andrew said. <laughs> the demon's going to say, Jesus I know, and Andrew I know, but who are you? You've got to find this out for yourself. It's got to be God's Word to you. And this is where so many people miss it. They just depend upon the pastor. They depend upon some television minister or somebody, and you're going by what they say. Boy, you need to take what we say, and you need to go to the Word of God and meditate on it until God speaks it to you. You know, the Lord ta taught me this over 40, nearly 50 years ago. And I used to take copious notes. I mean, I would nearly transcribe things word for word. And then I went back and started reading some of my notes, and they were wrong. Some of the things I was copying down were not things that were consistent with Scripture. And I realized I was just taking whatever a person said and just nearly swallowing it. And I got to praying about it, and the Lord spoke to me from John 14, 26, says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and lead you into all truth and bring to your remembrance all things whatsoever I've said unto you. And from that time on, I decided, all right, God, I'm going to open up my heart. I'm going to focus on what I'm hearing this person say, but I'm depending upon you to bring back to me what God is speaking. And that way, anything of the flesh that gets in there, anything that's not of you, you aren't going to bring it back to me. And so that's the way that I function now. It's been nearly 50 years since I've sat down and taken notes. I'm not against you taking notes, but I am saying that you have to make it personal. You can't just take what somebody else says. It needs to be God. So I listen to other people. I meditate on it until God speaks it to me. And once he speaks to me, I don't quote somebody else. I've actually had mentors in my life that if I was to call their name, most of you would know who they are. You would recognize these names. But the reason that I don't mention these people very often is because of the very thing that we're talking about. I'll take what they say, but then I'll meditate on it and pray about it. And when God speaks it to me, I don't sit here and say, so-and-so said. I say, God spoke to me. And I believe that that's the reason that Satan came to, add, uh, to Eve first is because she got the information secondhand. And, you know, we could sit there and blame Eve and criticize her, but she didn't know how, uh, she didn't know what was at stake. She was deceived. She didn't know what was going on. Notice also that this serpent, before he could get them to do anything, he said, has God said? He had to, first of all, attack the Word of God. If we were to just go by what the Word says, and if we didn't do anything except believe and act on the Word of God, Satan would have no power against you whatsoever. If Eve would have just said, yes, that's exactly what he said, end of discussion, and if she had walked away, praise God, we'd still all be in perfection, or somebody else would have blown it. But this is where she made her mistake. She began to entertain questions about the accuracy of what God's Word says. And, you know, I dealt with this on yesterday's program. I'm not going to go back there, but so many people believe in a gap teaching, which in, would embrace all of the evolution teaching today that is quote unquote science, which it is not science. And uh, some people just, they, they listen to all of these other things and they don't believe in the accuracy of what God's Word says. Boy, the moment you do that, I guarantee you, you're headed for destruction. I could turn over to Psalms chapter 19 and read about the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament shows His handiwork, and then it goes on down and shows you that the Word of God is pure and it makes the wise simple. And it just talks about the power of God's Word to protect us. The moment you get out of the Word of God 
and you start going by listening to these other voices, the voices of modern day snakes that are challenging the Word of God, I guarantee you, you're fixing to have a fall. And so Satan just kept persisting and finally said, you know, God didn't really mean that. What he meant was, and he began to start changing it, that you will be like God's. God is trying to hold things back. He's trying to keep you from experiencing your full potential. And so Eve submitted to these lies. She wanted to exalt herself and she believed that God was there to hinder her instead of help her. And she submitted to this lying snake. Did you know in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, that verse wasn't written yet, but the Word of God is forever settled. settled. These truths were in existence long before they were ever written down. So this was a truth even back in the Garden of Eden. And it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, it says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you yield to sin, you become the servant of sin. And so that verse is saying that whoever you yield to, you become their servant. You give them mastery. God had given Adam and Eve mastery, dominion over this earth. But when they submitted to Lucifer through believing these lies and they yielded, they made him their master. And I'm going to say something right here that I'm going to have to explain on tomorrow's program. But I believe that Lucifer was in the garden to bless and to serve Adam and Eve. He was there as Lucifer. When he transgressed, happened right here. Not in previous eons. It happened right here. And when Adam and Eve submitted unto him, Adam and Eve had been the God, small g, of this world. When they yielded, they made him their master. They made Lucifer the God of this world, which is what he's called often in Scripture. And so I, let me say it this way. God created Lucifer, an angelic, godly being. Adam and Eve created Satan. They're the ones that made him. They're the ones that empowered him. And again, I don't have time to explain that. Again, you've got to get these materials or listen in tomorrow. But I'll begin to explain to you how important this is to recognize that the power Satan is using against us is not some supernatural angelic power. It is the authority that God gave man over this earth. This is why demons have to have a physical body in order to do anything. They have to have somebody physical or something physical to flow through. I'll be dealing with this more on tomorrow's program. I encourage you to listen in, but please get these materials. I just can't explain all of these things in one program. You really need to get this and read it. I've got this book in English and in Spanish. I've got study guides. I've got a USB that has audio and video of this teaching on it. And then we have DVDs and CDs. And our announcer will give you all of this information.